and welcome to Yoga 1 and 2. Uh, today's class is going to go over some of the fundamental movement patterns and some of the equipment we may uh, use during the class or that may be beneficial to you. So let's get started. The first important thing is to have space and I'm very fortunate to have a little studio space um, but most, most of our <laughs> exercises will be on this mat. We won't go off of them. I do encourage you to, um, if you have the space, to do it on a harder floor. Carpet, if that's all you have, is a little bit more unstable. So when we do our balance exercises, it's a little more challenging. I actually have a carpet on top of concrete, so I do have extra padding because it can be pretty hard to do on concrete. So I actually struggle a little bit on this um, mat for balance poses. Just a little different terrain to, to work with. <clears throat> when it comes to your mat, uh, there's so many options out there now, and it's really all about what you want to work with and what you can afford. I personally love working on a cotton mat. I Before this, I was working with just a cotton blanket on top of this, but of course, traditional yoga mats look similar to this, and they're rubber. If you are um, using a thinner mat, maybe have an extra strip to put underneath where your knees go. And, or you can fold up a mat into double when we go into more uh, knee poses. They do make thicker mats. And again, this causes a little bit of instability. I've seen it in in-person in classes where people are standing on the mats that are about a half inch thick. And it causes some <clears throat> challenge <laughs> to that balance. Again, it's just an added instability that may or may not be beneficial to you. So you choose your own mat. The other thing that um, I will use a lot of our yoga blocks, one or two of them. If you don't have access to yoga blocks or you don't have them, you don't have to go out and buy them, maybe a book. The only thing is books are good for underneath the hips or the neck. So, but if you need them for poses um, that we'll go into here shortly <clears throat> to put your hands on, books can sometimes work too. The other thing that I have found beneficial um, for some people is a foam roller. And this is just a short one. You can use it as a bolster. You can use it under your head or under your hips in place of yoga blocks. And a lot of people have them and don't use them. So if you have one, maybe keep that handy. Maybe you'll find that it's uh, beneficial to you. And I'm gonna show you a little trick for plank pose when we go into that too with the foam roller. Um, I do use a few random tools for breathing and um, Stretching, I do a lot of fascial yoga, so we'll be working with our fascia too. A Pilates ball, a little squishy. Again, you don't have to go out and buy one if you don't want one. A small pillow will generally work too. Um, just make sure that it's soft and squishy. This ball <clears throat> um, can be also substituted with like a little kid's toy ball, like a little beach ball. Just let some of the air out of it if that's possible. Uh, we will use uh, tennis balls are great, but I use these uh, yoga tuna balls. They're squishy. They're specifically designed. Tennis ball is a little hard, so if you do get a tennis ball, you can see how it doesn't smush. And this one does. has a little give to it. Step on your tennis ball. <clears throat> Step on it with shoes on and just really break it down. These ones have been stepped on numerous times and see how they have give, where this one doesn't have much give. You can squeeze it pretty good. I've actually worked on that one. But these ones are really really nice. Uh, if you have them available, place them in a sock and tie a knot if you have a couple of them. <clears throat> this one has a case that we can actually take, I can, not we, I can take out and use as a single ball. We won't use these a lot, but I will show you in this practice today how to warm up your feet. And I'm a very big advocate of warming up your feet, and you'll see this in a lot of my the other thing you might need is a bolster. This one I use for under my neck in Shavasana. I do like that, so when we're laying in bed at the end of meditation, I do like to put something underneath my neck often. Yoga straps, excellent. Again, you don't have to go out and buy a yoga strap. You can use a belt, a scarf. You just want something that doesn't have give. So I do have like elastic straps. Maybe you can see it a little bit in that corner. The rubber resistance bands, those can be used in a pinch, but they do give, and you want something that doesn't have to it. So a uh, bathrobe belt, a belt, a scarf, a dog leash, those all work for yoga straps. You just want to have them long enough that you can use them for passive stretching. All right, uh, having a blanket handy, 
Shavasana again, you might need that or to prop underneath your legs or your neck in a couple of the poses. Soft pillow to sit on maybe for seated meditations or again underneath your head, underneath your knees, underneath your back, wherever you may need it. So just have your tools handy. I have found that a little hand tilt is good, um, is a good substitute for your bolster. All right, so let's get into our practice. So have those, those things, if you need to go gather them, pause the video, <clears throat> go gather your stuff, and get your space set up. With your back, we're going to come into a seated position, and this is often where we'll start our practice. So if you find that it's difficult to sit with an upright position from here, one of the things that I have learned that I really like when I do seated meditation is I elevate my, my hips a little bit by sitting on the yoga blocks and I set them up side to side. Some of you might be small enough that one of them <laughs> suffices, but I like sitting on two just so I have that extra space. And it really helps support my lower back and gives me that extension that I'm looking for when I'm in a seated meditation. I am not a flexible individual. I have good mobility, but I am not super bendy. So you will very seldom ever see me go into lotus position. My knees just don't like to do that. So I sit just regularly cross-legged. If you find this position uncomfortable, of course, feel free to always sit in a chair. <clears throat> Pillows, blankets, rolled up mat, the, uh, the foam roller are all great to sit on. They help support through the hips and lengthen through the spine. So you get that nice long back that we're looking for and we can separate the little <laughs> discs and vertebrae in our spine. So go ahead and find your position and we'll just start with some simple breathing. And I encourage you to try breathing in through the nose and out. Palms up if that feels comfortable or just palms down or even your hands in your lap. Close your eyes and let your breath just come naturally in through the nose and out. One or two breaths. And just notice where your breath is right now. We'll definitely focus on breath throughout the class. Is it hard to breathe in through your nose and out? Does it feel uncomfortable? Where does your breath go? Does it stay shallow in the top of your ribs? Does it move down to the bottom? Do you feel your diaphragm move? Are you able to bring that breath all the way down into your belly, down to the pelvic floor? Rooting your tailbone and sacrum, the base of your spine, into the earth. Let the breath come in soft and travel out soft. The inhale is inspiration. The exhale is expiration. We inspire as we breathe in. We expire as we breathe out. Each inhale is drawing in prana, our vital life force, our energy. And each breath is allowing things to go out that no longer serve purpose. We release those items, those thoughts, those feelings that will not serve us here on our mat today. And with our next breath, we recognize <clears throat> that this practice comes from a long lineage of people before us of practitioners, of yogis, of gurus, women, men, all individuals that have practiced yoga and handed it down generation to generation. Each flow that we practice has most likely been done before me. And I thank those who came before me and came before us to provide Breathe in and breathe out. And as you breathe, start to lengthen through the spine and allow that spine to move upright. The crown of your head moves towards the sky. Maybe your chin comes back a little bit and every breath allows space in between those vertebrae. We lengthen and with that lengthening, we feel an ease of the breath. Our diaphragm is allowed to move and massage our organs. Our lungs fill up a little bit easier. And our ribcage starts to move in a circular, a 360 degree. We're not just moving up and down in the front or up and down by our shoulders. We're 
continue to round our ribs fully through the back with ease and softness. One more breath in. Allow your eyes to open. Bring your hands up in the air and just stretch. This is what I call pandiculation. Well, it's what a lot of people call pandiculation, but we're just gonna move however our body feels like we need to right now as we start to warm up that spine. Maybe you've moved Maybe you're doing this practice in the evening and you've already moved, or maybe you're doing this first thing. So I like to move like a cat or a dog when they first get out of bed and just stretch my spine, kind of finding what it needs, what feels nourishing. And then we'll just take one big breath in and hands come through to heart center. Take a breath here. And we'll get, begin breaking down our pose. So our first pose, we're going to start it. Well, actually, technically, we've done a pose. We've been sitting <laughs> in our seated meditation, meditation position. But we're just going to come into Tadasana. And Tadasana is mountain pose. And it's simply <clears throat> just standing with your feet on your mat, hands forward, knees soft. So when we stand, we don't want to lock our knees out. And if you're a bendy person, I'm going to cue you too. If you happen to have a little bit of hypermobility or extra extension in your body, I'm going to cue you too. So we want our knees soft. We don't want them locked out. We just want them a little soft. Make sure your ankles, knees, and hips are all in a line. Palms forward. They're just relaxed. Now the next step in Tadasana is to, and I'm going to adjust my camera just a little bit. My head's getting cut off. Sorry about that. Getting everything into position here. <laughs> so we want that feet, feet, ankles, knees, hips stacked, <clears throat> knees soft. We want to check where our hips are in the world. Do you tend to stand this way or do you tend to extend? And then week two will kind of go over the spine more. But just for Tadasana today, for mountain pose, I want you to kind of think about tucking your pelvis forward. We don't want a full tuck. So we just want a little tuck, so our back end isn't sticking out like duck butt. Just a little bit in. And then we think about drawing the belly button to our spine. <clears throat> and from here, our ribs and hips are now stacked over one another. When our butt's out, notice that my ribs flare forward. That makes it really difficult for that diaphragm to move correctly, because we want to be in just a little bit. We're not so tucked that everything's engaged and we can't breathe. But we have this nice little anti-rib flare. It's just a little bit of rib stacking. So if you place your thumb on the bottom of your ribs, not your floating ribs, not the ones that aren't attached to your sternum, but the bottom of your ribs, and the pinky on top of your hip bones, and let them kind of go wide, the palms go wide, and then bring the thumb and pinky a little bit closer together. That's stacking your ribs. So from the side, it looks like this. Wide, and the next stack. Keep the knees soft. And then we're going to lift through the sternum without moving that rib tuck. And it's not super tucked. Remember, we're not tightening everything. We're not clenching. It's just soft. And then we lift through the ribs. So we have that really lovely wide open space. The next step will be to roll our shoulders back just a little bit. Opening up that chest, that ability to breathe so we're not hunched where we live in this world on our computer, on our phone, with that neck jutting forward. Right? We roll it back. Everything's stacked. Next is our chin, and again, we have that tendency to do this because we're on our phone, we're on our computer, or we're driving. So we want to just bring that back just a little bit, and then we extend from <laughs> our crown of our head. So let's do it all from the feet up. Spread the toes, <clears throat> heels underneath the ankles, knees soft, knees over the ankles, hips over the knees. Gently roll those hips back by bringing the belly button towards the spine, ribs slightly knitted to the hips, and then we lift through the sternum, open the palms forward by rolling those shoulders back, draw the chin in, and then extend through the crown of your head, lengthening through the neck. And just take a few breaths here. So while Tadasana is our resting pose often, in a flow. It's also a very active pose. If you're just standing with this, this posture, <laughs> this pose, it's actually
actually a very active pose. You'll feel some muscles working and firing and maybe even a little bit of heat forming. But the ability to breathe should be nice and easy. And this is a great recovery pose. So anytime you feel winded or fatigued in a practice, please feel free to come into the asana. There's a couple other ones we will work at too that you can use for rest poses. <clears throat> One more breath here. talk about rooting. So rooting our feet is very important to balance poses. So I'm going to demonstrate with one of my yoga chin-up balls. I'm going to take a single one and what you're going to do is I'm going to come a little bit closer. On our feet we have this lovely little ankle bone on both sides and the heel bone. It's very large. This calcaneus is very large. We're going to find the middle spot. <laughs> so in between the two ankle bones and on the front of that calcaneus. We're going to place the ball on the floor and I'm going to stand sideways just so you can see. We're going to place that ball right underneath and this is going to help open and stretch our feet muscles. <clears throat> I love doing this. I do this before every practice. So I won't demonstrate it every time but please feel free to do this before each practice. It's a lovely, lovely um, way to get into Padabandha, which is your foot walk, which is grounding and rooting your feet into the earth to have a strong platform for balance poses. <clears throat> so we've got it placed, center of those two knobs on your ankle, and then the calcaneus, front side of that, and we're just going to keep our knees soft and just kind of push into it. Notice I'm not putting all my weight walking out. I'm just gently pressing. If you have plantar fasciitis, you tend to have that plantar fascia, um, irritation, go soft. Don't do it hard. This does actually help stretch that, but you can overdo it if you push too hard. And then I just move it slightly inward and do the inside. And it's just a little pumping. And normally I stand like this, so it looks more like this from the front. I'm not back in a little lunge position. I'm actually just doing it from there. Move it out to the side, little pumps. And then I'm going to roll my whole foot. And it's quick. You don't have to spend nearly as long as I'm demonstrating. It's a real just quick warm up. Like my pumps, I'll, I'll demonstrate it how fast I go on the other foot. <clears throat> Moving up to the ball of your foot or the arch of your foot, roll the inside, middle, and the outside. And anywhere you feel a little bit of tension or that you need a little more, feel free to step down onto that ball. This one's really squishy. I've used it for many years, <laughs> so it's really starting to break down. I might actually need a new one. And then on the ball of your foot, I like to spread my toes out and just kind of stretch here. Now, this again is one of those that if you haven't done it, it can be a very intense stretch. So we want to just press into it <clears throat> and then move up on the toes. So when I say press, it's just really light. If you've, if you've done it for longer, you can probably go a little bit heavier as you practice and get that foot warmed up and stretched. I've been doing these stretches for years, so my feet are pretty flexible that way, and it doesn't hurt them anymore. Great for after hiking, great for after walking, great before, before both of those also. But my favorite time to do this is for yoga practice. So then I just end up rolling the rest of my feet. The other thing that I like, the rest of my foot, <laughs> The other thing I like to do is because we're in downward facing dog and bending our big toes and little toes a lot, um, I like to stretch out that bend and get that flexion, or excuse me, yeah, flexion, extension <laughs> on my big toe. And then I do it on my little toes too. And then just one more roll. So when you're doing it on your own, it will look like this. This is about how long it takes for me to do that. So I pump the center two or three times. I move to the inside two or three times, move to the outside two or three times. So getting that heel and that plantar fascia warmed up, roll the whole foot, go to the arch, inside, feel really good, so I'm gonna just press into it, little stretch, middle, and then the outside of the arch. Ball of the foot, I just press around, wrapping my toes around it. I have really long toes, so that's easy for me to do if you have littler toes. You might not wrap all the way around the ball. And then get to the toes and actually grab the ball with your toes. Put that big toe up on the ball, let it stretch, 
move over to the little toes, let them stretch, and then just roll the whole feet. Good, and then go ahead and move that aside and just feel how your feet can spread the toes just a little bit easier, maybe rock back and forth. And you find that three points of contact, your big toe, your little toe, and your heel actually reach the earth and ground in just a little bit better. Root into that ground, Padabanda, rooting our feet into the earth. Go ahead and close your eyes and just feel that sensation. So lovely. <laughs> All right, so that's your feet. So once we have that warmed up, we're warming up this kinetic chain that connects from our big toe all the way along our spine to the crown of our head. This is a fascial line of muscles that are all connected. And when we warm up one part of it, it makes going into Uttanasana forward fold just a little bit easier. So Uttanasana, Uttanasana <clears throat> is our forward bend. And I'm going to demonstrate from this side just so you can see. Again, I keep my knees pretty soft, bringing your hands up in the air. And then just exhale and go ahead and just fold into it, however you go. Just notice where you are in space and then slowly roll up. And I do have these broken down a little bit more on videos in individual form. So if you want to review them, you don't have to watch this whole video again. There's a couple of videos located in the content area for you to watch. <clears throat> All right, so spread your toes, soften your knees. We're just going to break Utanasana forward fold down just a little bit more. And you'll hear it as forward bend. I say forward fold. <clears throat> so each to their own. But Utanasana, I will definitely use a lot in this. I do speak in some of the Sanskrit, or I do use some of the Sanskrit words. I'm still learning and I stumble over them sometimes, but <laughs> you will hear me say that. So Utanasana, our knees are soft, and it's actually, a lot of people come from their back into this pose. And when you come from your back, like if you go down like this, you kind of get stuck here. And that's where a lot of people struggle. So Utanasana actually starts as a hinge motion. So I want everyone to put their hands where their leg folds and meets their hip. So almost like you're wearing, uh, well, it's just where that crease is. I was gonna say where, where you're wearing like bikini briefs, but not everyone wears bikini briefs. So <laughs> feet spread out, spread those toes, soft knees. And we're just going to simply hinge and fold our upper half over that lower half where it meets. So if we were doing this standing, we're going to mimic that by folding over. So I'm going to push my hips back like I'm backing into a parking spot. My neck is going to stay long. I'm not going to drop my chin and I'm not going to look forward. I'm going to keep my neck nice and long, the crown of the head reaching towards that side of the room. And I push my hips back. So this is part of the fold. This is that half hinge that we're in and that we'll go to in Ardha Udnasana, which is halfway lift. So we're here, and this is where we allow our spine to roll down and come into that fold. Now, again, I'm not super bendy. I can touch the floor, and I'm not fully warmed up yet. I'll get better as we go. <laughs> but straight legs, if it feels comfortable, you can go there. I like to keep my knees soft, though, and just protect that lower back by having my belly Rest on my thighs. Relax the neck. And this is Utanasana. Again, you can practice in straight. And some of you might be able to bring your head all the way to your knees in that pose. Feel free to grab your toes, grab the back of your ankles, wherever it feels good. Now, let's say you don't reach the floor. <laughs> so, this is where our blocks come in handy. And I really love teaching with blocks. Yoga blocks changed my life. <laughs> they changed my whole practice. So spread the toes, find that position again, bring the hands up as you're breathing, exhale, reach forward, and just place yourself with your back nice and long onto the blocks. You can also use a chair here if the blocks aren't accessible enough, and you can let your head relax, or you can keep it a little bit longer. This is also a great position if you don't reach down very far for Ardha Udnasana or halfway lift. So we go into Udnasana and I often cue halfway lift. And this is that extension, that hip back, whoop, and then that hinge with the long back. Again, we don't look forward with our chin. We keep the neck nice and long. You can also place your hands on the block. So I'd love to have the blocks 
right outside. So if I ever need them and feel like I need a little extra support, I can stay here. And again, Ardu Utnasana, or halfway lift, is wherever you are. So if you're here in your forward fold, maybe Ardu Utnasana, your hands come to your thighs and you look forward. Looking past your toes, nice long neck. We're not looking down at our toes, or we're not looking at the wall opposite of us. Nice long neck. So, Utnasana, forward fold. Arda Utnasana, halfway lift. Halfway lift. Maybe you can come here for a nice halfway lift. Use what you got and what you need. This is where also a little foam roller might come in handy. All right, so that's Utnasana, forward fold. Our next one will be strengthening and learning how to engage our serratus. And our serratus is this lovely muscle that wraps around our ribs. It actually is faced this way. <laughs> I can't get my hands where they need to go to, to demonstrate that. But it's this muscle that actually assists us in our shoulder protection. And it's kind of hard to kind of figure out how to engage it. And I want to show you some ways to kind of tune into that because this will this this is a game changer for for planks, for downward facing dog, and for any of those strength poses that you might try. So balance poses. I'm just gonna turn my camera a little bit towards the wall. So if you have a wall or a door space, I want you to come up to it. Ooh, right in that. <laughs> that light there. Let's turn it down for just a second. Okay, so, oh, that doesn't work either. Sorry about that. So we're gonna just come to the wall and you're gonna stand straight up and down and place your hands on the wall right in front of your shoulders. Your elbows are just gonna be a little bit soft and I want you to imagine that you're trying to pull wallpaper down off the wall. So this is gonna help find that. And we're not gonna have our elbows bent. You're not doing this. Slightly soft, so my elbow's not locked out. It's just at a little, little bend, so my joint's not locked. <clears throat> Spread your palms, so your hands are wide, and then pull down. Make sure your shoulders aren't up. They're gonna gently roll down, away from your ears. You pull down like you're trying to pull that wallpaper off. Pull, 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 pushing into the wall and not letting your body collapse into it. So we're still just pulling. Almost pushing away from the wall like you're in a plank. And then press the pinky and the ring finger a little bit more into the wall than the other three. And that should help you feel this little pop, pop. The other thing you can do to find that that muscle to really feel it engaged is take your yoga block and place it behind you and squeeze. Now, this isn't accessible for everyone. The wall should be accessible for everyone, possibly, <laughs> hopefully. But if you take this, imagine that you're pressing it together, you can feel that muscle activate, that serratus activate. So, how does this apply to going into our plank. We're gonna move down to all fours. So when we get on all fours, we talk about this in the spine section a little bit, finding neutral spine. We want to have our knees underneath our hips so we're not pushed back, and then our wrist, elbows, and shoulders stacked. And I'll get to the wrists in just a moment because this might be difficult for some people. Look at where your elbows are in the world. If you, and I'm not hyper flexible, so when you are here, if your elbows point forward, they turn around, which is where you want your elbows to be, but if they actually kind of bend forward, I want you to place your elbows at a different position. So if you're bending, your elbows are going to be, instead of pointing back towards your knee, they're gonna be pointed at, if this was six, they're gonna be pointed at four and seven. Sorry. Four and eight, there we go, four and eight. <laughs> so we don't want our elbows pointing forward if you're super bendy. That puts a lot of pressure on that elbow joint, on your wrist and on your shoulder. The other thing to do is, first off, everyone should wrap their arms around their armpits. Like we're trying to wrap our shoulders, our armpits around our ribs. So we kind of take this little and then notice my back's like, whoop, <laughs> right now. I want you to just do that little hip tuck. So we're here, and I want you to just tuck just a little bit, wrap those armpits 
around your ribs. Figure out where your elbow crease is supposed to go. If you aren't hypermobile, I want your elbows to point forward and your, el your elbow points to point back towards your thigh. And then we push away from the earth. Push. And then press into those pinkies and those ring fingers just a little bit more. Nice on that. We're not looking down. We're not looking forward. That pinches our cervical spine. We want that nice long neck. Slightly tuck. Push. Notice that my shoulders aren't like this. We're here. And this is our foundation for going into plank and going into downward facing dog. Chaturanga. I make sound effects, by the way. <laughs> so that is how we strengthen and practice. And I'll cue this for the first couple weeks on that movement of getting into that serratus to support us in all the, the um, arm poses, the arm balance poses. Plank, downward facing dog, um, chaturanga, any of those. <clears throat> so when we go into plank, if your wrists are already chatty, one of the things that I recommend is folding up your yoga mat or having an extra mat just rolled up already. Can you see that? <laughs> Fold it up and then placing your palms on the edge there. That helps elevate that wrist so you're not going flat against the ground and pushing up. They actually make yoga blocks with hand holds on them that are um, quite helpful and beneficial, but they're, they're expensive and not necessary. You can also grab a set of dumbbells and hold onto them and come into this position here. That's a little bit harder in downward facing dog, but it might help you in the plank position. The other thing you can do is always choose a forearm plank. If we're ever doing any plank moves, we can also come into a modified downward facing dog. <laughs> Palms can be flat, so you can always come here. The next step through plank is we often do a move called chaturanga. So <laughs> I'm going to have everyone practice their plank from the knees first so we can practice the chaturanga move because we often are here and then we move forward through the upward facing dog or um, <clears throat> lowering down from plank, lower down and move up into cobra. So chaturanga is moving from plank down into that cobra position. We do that a lot in our sun salutations. So <laughs> everyone come to their knees if that's comfortable. You can also do this on a chair. There's some great videos in our uh, content area that have different modifications for all of these if you need to use um, chairs. So we want to make sure that we're not sagging and we're not all the way back. We want to have our hips and shoulders in a nice long line, including our neck. So everything's still stacked. We're pushing away from the earth. And when you go down in that move, I'm going to turn to the side just so you can, or to the front, so you can see where my elbows are in space. So notice that my elbow pits are pointed forward. I wrap my shoulders around. And as I lower down, notice that my arms don't go out. I see this a lot, and this is what puts your shoulders in a compromised position in yoga. So you're here and you're a little bit wider, and then you lower down, and your elbows come out. It's really hard to come back up into that cobra pose. So you want to keep your arms against your rib cage as you come down. So if I was in a seated position, and everyone can try this, come onto your knees or into a seated position, put your hands out in front of you like you're doing a plank, wrap. <laughs> those armpits around your rib cage so your shoulders are nice and in good position and then we just bring the arms along the rib cage drawing the elbows back and this is where you'll end up notice that my head just went a little bit forward because I'm turning my head <laughs> as you come down so let's do this without me going into an extended neck position here lower down we come here and then we're able to rise up from there so if you keep those elbows close, we don't ever really do this, right? When we press, we come here when we press. We would have a lot more strength, a lot more stability in our shoulders. So we want to make sure that we have that position. So from the knees, lower down, spread the pinkies, push away from the earth first. So 
We're resisting gravity the whole way down, and then we shift forward right at the bottom to move up. You drop your feet and press into the top of the feet. From here, we will talk about Cobra in just a moment, the extension in your back. So come back up, all fours, and you can choose to move forward onto the front of your knees in that plank, or come into a full plank. Spread the fingers, push away from the earth, wrap the armpits around, slowly lower down, shift forward, and come up into Cobra. All right, so that's Chaturanga. Remember, if you are here <laughs> and we move forward in plank, always feel free to drop your knees and come forward. We do that so many times and it's very, very difficult on shoulders. So if you're feeling a little bit um, less sure and less stable and less strong in that position, always drop your knees. Shoulders are really difficult <laughs> to recover. Shoulder injuries are difficult to recover from. And we do a lot of things that involve our shoulders in yoga. So please, please always take care to protect them. <clears throat> so I wanted to go into Adha Mukha Shavasana, which is our downward facing dog. Adha Mukha Shavasana. So we're here in this pose, right? Everyone's like, yeah, you totally get to do it. Wherever my feet need to be, I'm going to be up here. I'm going to point that tailbone up. Push, push, push. I want you to take it easy on that. So start in your all fours, tuck your toes first, push away from there. Find that strength in your shoulders through that serratus. Then step back into that plank, take a big deep breath, and as you exhale, push back into downward facing dog. If it feels comfortable, you can walk your feet up a little bit more, pedal through the heels, and then place both heels towards the earth as much as it feels comfortable. Next, I want you to check out where your elbows are. Mine automatically always turn out. I want you to turn those elbows more towards your thighs. And that's going to create this open space for that to engage. It's also going to bring this down to here. All right. The other way to make sure, so I'm going to just turn to the front so you can see what I'm speaking about. So I see this a lot in... I see that a lot in yoga. Sorry if you can't hear me well. I see this. And you want to have this space between your ears and your shoulders. So what I suggest to find this position, notice, watch the elbows. See that space created? I'm pushing away from the earth. What I suggest is trying this. So we're stacked. Turn the elbows towards your thighs. Push away from the earth. Nice long neck. Tuck the toes. Plank, and then exhale into that. Soften the knees, and you get this length in the arms from, from bending the knees. You get that space between the ears and the shoulders. Now straighten from there and maintain that. Downward facing dog can be a great rest pose, depending on where you are in your practice. So if you ever feel in the middle of a flow that you need to just rest, downward facing dog can be a good one. If you find that good shoulder support. I hated downward facing dog. <laughs> I hated staying in it until I figured it out because it always hurt my wrist because I wasn't activating the strong muscles, the bigger muscles around my shoulders. So make sure you find that. And if you have any questions about that, please feel free to email me. If you ever want to do just a quick Zoom meetup, we can totally do that and I can help you out and give you some pointers for it. So again, downward facing dog. I often come in it from plank, pushing the tailbone up towards the sky. You can keep your knees soft. Push away from the earth, elbows pointed towards your knees. Relax the neck if you want. You can shift your gaze forward to get a little more stretch. Or look down at your toes. All right. Child pose, just to rest those wrists. Let's go into Balasana, which is our child pose. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> child pose can be difficult. And I, again, am not very flexible. So, some of you will be able to sit your heels down and come into that. From all fours, we're just going to keep our knees together for this one. So, we have back support. Take a deep breath, and if you can, 
place the tops of your feet down into your mat. If that doesn't feel comfortable, of course, you can keep them there. Take a big deep breath, and as you exhale, push back. And just let yourself kind of move back and forth as we go into this. Just a little practice, just a little warm up. And then bring your head towards your mat. Now, again, some of you will actually be able to drop your hips down. I have very tight quads. <laughs> so my glutes actually don't sit down onto my heels when I'm in this position. If you're here and you're up a little bit higher, this is where your Pilates ball can come in handy. You feel like you want a little bit more support there. You can place that ball underneath. You can also use a pillow. And that might help you get your head to the earth. Little support. Just relax the arms. You can also always choose to bring the arms down beside. I usually cue where I want them depending on the stretch that I want you to feel. And child's pose is a wonderful recovery pose. The other way that I like to practice this is coming at it from a seated position on my knees. Now this might not be accessible to some of you sitting on your knees like this. So make do, find what works for you, choose another position. <laughs> so finding that forward fold and rounding over, notice that this allows me to keep my glutes on my heels. And I get this really lovely rounding through my back. This is where yoga blocks come in handy. Let's say you can't reach the, the earth in Velasana, child's pose. So you can always choose to put a block underneath your head. A little bit more elevated. That might be good if you have breast tissue or any extra tissue in front that you need um, support so you're not swishing everything. Or maybe you don't feel good and you don't want to press all your belly against your thighs. That's um, something that happens with me a lot. So I often, you'll see me use a block. Sometimes it just doesn't feel good. The other thing that you can always choose to do is have a wider knee. So my knees were like this in child pose. You can always choose to have your knees wide. Try to keep your feet together if that's possible. So I usually cue the edge of your mat bring the feet together, and this allows for more space to happen for your front side to go. So your belly's not squished against your, against your thighs, because that doesn't always feel good. And again, you can stay there. Same thing goes with the ball underneath the heels. That feels really nice, nice and supported. You can use both yoga block and the ball. depending on what you want to feel. This is a little bit more of a hip opener, so it can feel really nice. So that's Velasana. Next up, we're gonna go into bridge since we're on the floor. Bridge pose, um, I see this, this a lot. So <laughs> when we're in bridge pose, have a block handy or your ball handy or your pillow handy. People just come here and they go straight up. No regard to where their neck is, where their hips are, where their feet are. I like to cue the feet in this pose because we get a lot more hamstring involvement in it. And um, walk your feet up as close as it feels good. If that's not comfortable on your knees, of course, you can always keep your feet a little bit further out. This will be a, a more shallow bridge. You won't get the, the stretch from your ribs, from your thoracic spine as much when you're here. And that's great. Protect your lower back a little bit. And I'll show you some support for this pose in just a moment. So place your hands down by the sides. We want that chest nice and open. So press your shoulder blades into the ground. Press your fingers into the ground. This adds strength and support through the arms. Then spread your toes. And we're gonna find that rooting into the floor. So we're gonna push into the earth. And notice what happens to my hips. I'm just gonna lift my hands so you can see it. Notice what happens to my hips. They already lift off when I push into my feet. So bridge pose starts with our feet and our hands pressing into the earth. This contact into the earth triggers our core to become stable. As we push in, that whole core kind of starts firing. And as we press, we lift up and you should feel your hamstring. 
we don't actually squeeze our glutes, our butt muscles, until we get to the very top. The other thing you want to think about is where is your chin and your neck. So place your hands behind your occipital lobes, that base of your skull, and just kind of pull it and lengthen it. It's going to drop your chin in just a little bit. We get this lovely long line in our neck. Press into the hands. Roll those shoulder blades down into the ground. Press into the feet and start pushing up. From here, if you want to get that little extension in the ribs, you can push a little farther. Just make sure your chin doesn't come up to access that. Squeeze through the glutes. Draw the belly button down. Very active pose. And I'll cue further advanced moves as we go through class. One way to start getting into that pose a little bit more comfortably is to place a yoga block underneath your hips. Press down into the hands still. So we're still active. We're finding that strength in the pose and pushing through our feet still, but we have this support for our lower back. I place it right about underneath my sacrum, that fused spine between my hips. <clears throat> And that adds for a really nice support to kind of start seeing where I need to feel it. So you can always choose to do a supported bridge. Take it out, lower it down. And when we go into any extensions, I like to go into a little bit of flexion. So draw your knees in and just let that spine relax. <sighs> Place the feet down. And Slowly walk yourself up. We're going to move back onto all fours. And I want to go over lunge position. Anjane asana, because we do this a lot in our sun salutations. And when we come into Anjane asana or the lunge, it's often from downward facing dog. So find a good downward facing dog or just watch first and then practice. I often cue you to go into three-legged dog to lift. So we don't open through that hip. We keep the hips nice and square. And what happens is, is people don't have the strength to push away from the floor to draw their foot up. And my foot doesn't always come right up. <laughs> so I often walk my foot up. Most people don't have long enough arms or the strength to create the space to come up into the lunge position. So again, this is where yoga blocks come in handy. So try to keep them there. A lower position is probably going to be sufficient for most people. So if I'm in downward facing dog, I cue, lift the right leg into three legged dog, Anjaneyasana, step through to lunge. I just created a ton more room for that to happen. So I come here, my hands might be on the earth, I'm going to walk up to my block, or block and create this space. And again, nice long line, pushing away. We're never just lax, not just ugh, hanging out. We want to push and find that strength. So we find this, step back, find downward facing dog. Try it with your other leg. Left leg up, three-legged dog, Anjaneyasana, step through the lunge. Notice that my left leg is a little bit more flexible. <laughs> Always just have a little bit more space. Use your blocks if that feels good. And you can try different heights. Some of you might be here. In fact, some of you, when you come into your lunge, might just be here. And that's okay. You are where you are, wherever you're starting. Listen to your body. Don't force it into any of these positions if you're not there yet. So let's say Anjane Asana and you don't reach the floor or those blocks at all. Step up. And maybe you're here. You step to there and find your way up to that lunge position. All right. <laughs> so let's go through a sun salutation. This week, you're going to watch this video. The directions were already being you know, so you'll already know this. Um, and then you're going to watch the other form videos, which will go over Virabhadrasana, the warriors. And there's a couple other <clears throat> on there for you to look at. All right, so, <clears throat> sun salutation. Start at the back of your mat. <clears throat> Find mountain pose, spread the toes, soft knees. <sighs> Tuck 
and the belly button, bringing those hips just a little bit forward, ribs stacked, sternum lifted, roll the armpits around the ribs, palms forward, close the eyes, lengthen through the crown of the head, and just push that chin back just a little bit. Take three breaths, in through the nose, and out. Inhale, bring the arms up above the head. Exhale, Utanasana, forward fold. Knees soft. Let the head relax. Inhale, Ardha Utanasana, halfway lift. Exhale, Utanasana. Walk yourself out to plank. Inhale, exhale, downward facing dog. Inhale, lift that right leg. Exhale, Ardha. Arms, Arjuna, 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 oh my goodness. Ah, inhale. Exhale, step back to plank. Chaturanga, lower down. Inhale, cobra. Keeping the arms by the side. Pelvis pressed in. Nice long neck. We're not looking forward. We're not looking down. Exhale, lower down to the ground. Tuck the toes. Press up to plank. Inhale. Exhale, downward facing dog. Shift your gaze to the front of the mat. Hop or walk. Top of the mat. Utnasana. Forward fold. Inhale, Ardha Udnasana. Exhale, Udnasana. Forward fold. Inhale, rise all the way up. Hands come up above the head. Exhale through to heart center. Inhale, lift the arms up. Exhale, swan dive. Forward fold. Udnasana. Inhale, halfway lift. Exhale, lower down. Step back into plank this time. Inhale, exhale, downward facing dog. Push away from the earth, elbows pointed towards the thighs. Inhale, lift the left leg. Exhale, Anjanasana. Step through. Use your blocks if needed. I move my blocks to the side. I will demonstrate them. <laughs> Inhale, exhale, hands come back down to the earth. Step back into plank. <clears throat> Chaturanga, drop the knees, lower down. Press the feet into the earth. Press the hips down into the ground, belly button to the spine. Lift up, cobra. Nice long neck. Arms stay by the side. Exhale, lower down. Press up. Plank. Inhale. Exhale, downward facing dog. Find the strength in this pose. Balance between the hands and the feet. Soften the knees. Walk your hands back to your feet for Udnasana. Relax the neck. Inhale. Ardha Udnasana. Exhale. Udnasana. Inhale, rise all the way up. Hands come through to heart center. Inhale, lift up the hands toward the sky, fold forward, swan dive, Utnasana. Inhale, Ardha Utnasana, halfway lift. Exhale, hands come down to the earth, walk yourself out to plank. Inhale, exhale, downward facing dog. Inhale, lift the right leg, Arjunayasana, step through to lunge, using the blocks if needed. Inhale, exhale, step back into plank. Chaturanga, all the way down. Lift up into Cobra. Exhale, lower down. Inhale, press up. Plank. Exhale, downward facing dog. Shift your gaze to the front of the mat. Hop or walk into your forward fold. Utanasana. Inhale, Ardha Utanasana, halfway lift. Exhale, forward fold. Inhale, rise all the way up. Hands through the heart center. I'm going to take you through one more version of sun salutation. We'll start at the back of our mat again. So there's a lot of different versions. That was just one. We'll start with another one. So come to mountain pose. Find your version. Soft knees, spread the toes, tuck the hips slightly, belly button to the spine, lift through the chest, shoulders back, chin in, extended to the crown, extended through the crown. Breathe. And you might have a little bit of an increased heart rate. It's a great warm up. Inhale, lift the arms. Exhale, forward fold. Inhale, walk yourself out into plank. Breath in. Exhale, downward facing dog. Inhale, chaturanga. Move forward, lower down, all the way through. 
up into upward facing dog. When you're in upward facing dog, you don't want to drop your hips toward the earth. It's actually a very strong pose, so I press into the top of my feet, draw the belly button to the spine, shoulders pushed down and back, nice long neck, not like this, not letting that spine completely extend. Inhale, exhale, <sighs> Balasana, child pose. Inhale, move forward into plank, downward facing dog. Inhale, shift your gaze forward, hop or walk to the top of the mat. Utnasana, forward fold. Inhale, halfway lift, Ardha Utnasana. Exhale, forward fold. Inhale, rise all the way up. Hands come up into a little salute. And then hands through the heart center. Close your eyes and just feel your heartbeat. Feel the heat you created just from doing that little flow. Feel free to practice along a little bit further. But we're actually going to move now down into Shavasana. So before we go into that, I want to show you one of my favorite ways to kind of warm up for Shavasana. How do you warm up for Shavasana? Well, all of the movement that we do in our flow actually helps us get ready for any sort of guided meditation or stillness. And I like to say that we're never really still. <laughs> our heart's beating, we're digesting, our blood is pumping, our breath is moving, our lungs are filling and expanding and collapsing and expanding and collapsing. So we're never really still. So when you feel like, I can't sit still, know that you never really are still. <laughs> so our practice actually expels all that energy in our body to help us come into this rest position. But sometimes what I have found is that when we're here, we have a little bit of tension still in our lower back. So this is where the two balls in a sock or if you have access to the yoga tuna balls. And you can place them underneath your sacrum. And they kind of form this lovely support. I say lovely a lot. This really nice support <laughs> along the sacrum, right along that line between where your iliac, that bone from your hip, and the sacrum form, the, the um, joint. It's called the iliosacral joint. So, um, I just kind of rock back and forth. And I'm not on my lower back. I'm where the bones of my hips meet the spine. So I just kind of rock back and forth. And then I move them down just a little bit more. Rock back and forth. And move them down just a little bit more. Rock back and forth. And if you find a section that actually feels like it needs a little bit more love and attention, you can just kind of hang out there. Maybe walk the feet forward and out, or even lift the leg up and down. We'll widen the feet and really walk, rock side to side and get in there. And just take a few moments if you need that to allow for those hips. Oh, it feels so amazing every time I do that, to become a little bit more comfortable. So Shavasana, our pose, corpse pose, it's usually our final resting. And this is where a blanket might come in handy. Again, I like my bolster underneath my neck. The yoga tuna balls, if you have the bigger sets, these tennis balls are a little bit bigger, feel really nice underneath your neck. Um, a bolster underneath your knees might help your lower back a little bit. So I use a bolster underneath my neck and sometimes, depending on how my back's feeling, I might actually place that or a blanket underneath. And of course, you want to do what feels right for you. Hands can be on your belly or palms up and wherever you want your feet to be. They can be on the floor if that's more comfortable, extended. And of course, you can always feel free to do this from a seated position too. Let's take a few moments to come back to our breath that we started with. Palms up. And we breathe down into our feet. Wiggle the toes and relax them. We breathe down into our ankles and relax them. Breathe into our calves, our shins. Let any tension 
Release with the breath out. We breathe into our knees. And we breathe out any tension. Breathe into the thighs, the hamstrings, the quads. Maybe you feel your feet open even more as you let out the breath and they relax. Breathe down into your pelvic floor, into that diaphragm, into those hips. Sorry, I said diaphragm, into the hips. Into that lower belly, through the glutes. Breathe in and release any tension there. The back side should feel pretty good if you rolled it. Breathe into the belly, into those organs of digestion. Let any tension, anything that no longer serves to you, just dissipate out with the breath. The lower back releases any stress. Breathe into the ribs. The heart, the lungs move. Shoulders relax on your next breath in and out. Your fingertips gently fall open. Your palms relax into the earth, your wrists, your elbows, your arms. Breathe in through the nose and imagine the skin on your face down through your neck, releasing, moving towards the mat. Inhale, the next breath around your hairline eases, softens. You might even feel your ears drop towards the mat. Breathe into the back of your skull, the back of your neck. Let it melt into the floor, into the earth below you. Breathe and feel your whole body relax into your mat. free to continue this Shavasana breath in through the nose and out for as long as you want. You can pause and just stay there. When you're done, unpause the video. Bring your feet underneath you, wiggle your fingers, and gently roll to your right side. Take a moment Open your eyes and let the room come back to you with the sounds, the smells, the light. And gently roll yourself up. Come into that seated position. Place blocks underneath you if that's beneficial to you. <sighs> hands on your knees, palms up if that feels right. I join my hands in front of me. An Anjali Mudra. Um, I do practice a little bit of thanks at the end of each practice. This is optional and up to you. I do um, sing, I do mantras, and um, some chants. So, again, up to you. And I just want to thank you all for being here and being part of this practice. I'm so excited to have you in class and to be part of the journey with you. The world needs more yogis. And it doesn't mean that you have to be a yoga teacher. You can practice yoga in your daily life through breath, through movement, and just through kindness and love. So thank you for being here. We'll close with one ohm. Again, it's optional to you. Breathe in.